last week's episode, we had Jeff Hinton on the show. We covered so much ground from the early days when very few people were working on neural nets and deep learning, through the ImageNet, AlexNet breakthrough moment, through Jeff's current work and vision for the future of AI. As you might recall, we also gave you an opportunity to contribute questions through Twitter. In today's episode, we'll discuss some of these questions with Jeff. But before we dive into our very last episode of season two, I just want to say it has been such a pleasure and honor to have so many amazing guests on the show this season. We had guests explaining how AI is being used in real businesses today, like Flora Tassi on building AI for customer service, Amit Prakash on helping companies use AI to make better decisions, and Benedict Evans on what really matters about tech today. There were guests using AI to solve major health issues, like George Netcher on using AI to protect the elderly with fall detection. Athelis Tanay Tandon on using AI to improve blood testing. Andrew Song on how AI is helping give back hearing to people worldwide. And Pram Hedge on using AI to improve training and prevent injuries in sport. We had guests using AI for social good, like Iana Howard tackling bias in AI. Revolution Robotics Jared Schrieber on teaching children about AI robotics, and David Rolnick on using AI to fight climate change. We also had guests who are using AI in industry giants, like Microsoft's Eric Horvitz on using AI for the greater good, and Shakir Mohamed from DeepMind on weather prediction. There were guests using AI in consumer applications, like Spotify's Gustav Söderström on AI in delivering personalized experiences. Amit Agarwal from The Yes on using AI to serve up a better experience in fashion. And Etsy's Mike Fisher on AI in e-commerce. We had guests using AI in transportation and futuristic vehicles, like Adam Bree on using AI to power Skydio drones, MIT's Kathy Wu on the future of our roads, and Alex Kendall on Waves driverless cars. We had guests making AI accessible to all through open source, like Russ Whiteman and Hugging Faces' Clément DeLong. And we kicked off and ended our series with academic leaders in the field, like Sergey Levin from UC Berkeley on our current research challenges in AI, and, of course, last, but by no means least, Jeff Hinton. Speaking of which, let's get to your questions for Jeff. But Jeff, th thank you for making the extra time for um, audience questions. It's actually the first time we do this on, on the podcast, and we had so many questions on Twitter for you. It's clear uh, so many people want to learn from you, and have questions for you. Hopefully we can get through a, a bunch of these questions. Let me kick it off with um, a question from somebody you are very familiar with, Ilya Sitzkever. What were some of the hardest times research-wise on the path to making deep learning work? Was there ever a time where it just wasn't clear how to even make the next step? I think there were, it was always the case that there were things that worth trying, even if they didn't work and consistently didn't work. Um, I never reached a point where I thought there's just, I can't see where to go from here. There were always many possibilities, many leads to kind of follow up, um, most of which ended in dead ends. But um, I think good researchers always have like dozens of things they'd like to try and they just don't have time to try them. So for me, there was never a point where I thought it's completely hopeless. There's particular algorithms that at times I thought they're completely hopeless, like Boltzmann machine learning. Um, sometimes I think it's hopeless, sometimes I don't. Um, but the whole enterprise of, which I could now phrase as, can you find objective functions and get their gradients so that you can learn by stochastic gradient descent? Um, that whole enterprise always seemed to me to be, um, there were always 
directions you could go to push it forwards. And I have a second question from Ilya, a very different question. Are you ever concerned that AI is becoming too successful and too dominant? Uh, yeah, the two things that concern me most are its use in weapons, because that will allow countries like the United States, for example, to have little foreign wars with no casualties by using robot soldiers. I don't like that idea. Um, even worse, its use in targeting particular subpopulations to swing elections. So the kind of stuff that was done by Cambridge, Cambridge Analytics, and that I believe was very influential in both Brexit and the election of Trump, um, I think it's very unfortunate that techniques like deep learning are going to make that kind of operation more efficient. A question from Puria Mistani. Is deep learning hitting a wall? Will AGI be achieved by scaling up neural connectivities in deep learning architectures? It won't be achieved just by scaling up neural numbers of parameters or neural connectivities, but it's not hitting a wall. Um, I recognize where that quote comes from. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of attention grabbing quote. Um, and this is regularly, it's said that deep learning is hitting a wall um, and it keeps making more progress. And if any of the people who say it's hitting a wall would just write down a list of the things it's not going to be able to do, um, then five years later we'd be able to show we've done it. Yeah, I, I like that notion that anybody who wants to claim something's hitting a wall, to make a list of things it cannot do. And that that's great yeah. inspiration for all the rest of us to see if we can can make it happen or yeah. not. And But it has to be fairly well-defined what it can do. Like there was Hector Levesque, who's a symbolic AI guy, and a very good one, um, actually made a, a, a criterion, which is the Winograd sentences, where you say things like the, the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too small, versus the trophy would not fit in the suitcase because it was too big. And if you want to translate that into French, you have to understand that in the first case, it refers to suitcase, and in the second case, it refers to trophy because they're different genders in French. And the early machine translation with neural nets was random. It couldn't get the gender right when it translated to French. It's getting better all the time. Um, but at least Hector made a very clear definition of what it would mean for a neural net to understand what was going on. And we're not there yet, but we're, we're I think we're considerably better than random now. That, I'd like to see more of that by people who are skeptics. Mm -hmm. Great challenges. Yeah. Next question is from. Eric Jang, actually one of your colleagues at, at Google. Um, what are three questions that keep you up at night, not necessarily restricted to machine intelligence? When is the attorney general finally going to do something? That keeps me up at night because um, time's running out. I, that's what I worry about most. How does the world deal with people like Putin who have nuclear weapons? And... Does the brain use backpropagation or not? Love the contrast. Of that <laughs> Third one <laughs> with the other two. <laughs> Eric had another question. I'm going to go here. Um, you spent years working on topics that mainstream machine learning community thought was niche. What advice do you have for contrarians trying to produce the next AlexNet result? Just trust your own intuitions. I have this standard thing I say, which is either you've got good intuitions or you haven't. If you haven't got good intuitions, it doesn't matter what you do. And if you have got good intuitions, you should trust them. But of course, that needs to be um, padded out with where do intuitions come from? And good intuitions come from a lot of hard work trying to understand things. And basically, I think we're based just analogy machines. So lots of experience with similar things is where intuitions come from. And so you just need a lot of experience. And then trust your intuitions. The next one comes from Danielle Nunham. Um, what is the connection, as you see it, between mania and genius? Ah, that's very interesting. I'm slightly manic depressive, so I tend to oscillate between um, having very creative periods when I'm not very self-critical 
and having mildly depressed periods when I'm extremely self-critical. And I think that's more efficient than just being kind of uniform. So what happens in manic periods is you just ignore all the problems. You're, you're so sure there's something exciting here that, yeah, sure, there's all those obvious problems, but don't let those stand in our way. Let's get on with it. Um, and then when you're depressed, all these obvious problems overwhelm you. And um, the question is, can you keep going and sort them out and figure out whether the idea really was good or not? And I tend to sort of alternate like that, which is why every so often I tell people, I figured out how the brain works. And then I go through a long period of figuring out why that isn't actually true, um, which is slightly depressing. I think it's just got to be like that. Um, there's a there's a poem by William Blake um, that has it's a, it has a pair of lines in it that go joy and woe are woven fine a clothing for the soul divine, and it's basically saying that's just the nature of being that joy and woe are woven together, and I think that's the nature of research too, and if you don't get really excited, and you don't get really fed up when it doesn't work, um, you're not a real researcher. Well, maybe you're just a different kind of researcher. There's a related question as part of that. What childhood experiences shaped you the most and how? I think the most formative experience was coming from a home in which um, everybody was clear that religion was nonsense and being sent to a private school, um, which was a Christian school, where when I was seven and I first went there, everybody believed in God. Everybody except me, that was. Um, that was a very formative experience for me. Um, possibly because I got a large ego, I realized that everybody was wrong. But having that experience of seeing everybody else being wrong and gradually over the years, seeing them change their minds and seeing these teenage boys say, well, maybe, maybe God isn't real. Um, that was very helpful. The next one is from Bishal Binayak. What's your thought process to solve a research problem? Is it mainly focusing on machine learning? Probably implying well, maybe, course, you know, the question is, do you also need to think about other fields to do what you're of doing? Of course, we don't, we don't necessarily have good insights into our own thought processes. Um, but I, I guess I tend to work a lot with analogies. So at least I'm consistent. That is, I, I think the basic form of human, re human reasoning is analogies, which are based on having the right features in big vectors. And um, that's how I do research too. I, I try and look for similar things. And maybe it's not so much try as similar things sort of pop into my mind. Um, and I, I think everything I'm doing is a kind of result of these analogies with many, many other things via these feature vectors, where I'm sort of basically unaware of many of these analogies, but they're definitely there. That's not very helpful, but I, I don't really know. The, the following question here also from Bishal is, what's the next big thing on AI and advice for PhD students to which area to focus on? I think a next big thing I don't think there's the next big thing. A next big thing is going to be a convincing learning algorithm for spiking neural nets that is able to deal with both the discrete decision about whether to spike or not and the continuous decision about exactly when to spike and that makes use of spike timing to do interesting computations that would be much more difficult to do in non-spiking neural nets. That would be my bet about um, one of the big things. But the other thing and what... The reason the deep learning revolution is going to keep going is that actually, if you just make a bigger one, you don't need any new ideas. You already get things working better. Um, it's slightly depressing if your trade is new ideas, but if your trade is how do you build hardware to make a bigger one, then it's great. The next one is from Think or Swim. What is Professor Hinton's regret in research choices so far that is something he wished he had delved into but chose not to, and now perhaps a regret looking back? Time's short, so I'll just say a learning algorithm for spiking neural nets. You wish you'd already done it, but now you, you yeah. can still yeah. do it in the next yeah. year, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe. Jordan Histroff 
has the following question. How important is embodiment for intelligence, given the recent DALI results from OpenAI? And I'll say I'm personally really curious about that too, working on a lot of embodied intelligence myself. So I think one needs to distinguish the engineering version of this question from the philosophical version of this question. So the philosophical version is, could a being sitting in a room listening to a radio and watching a television figure out how the world worked, even if it couldn't actually move anything? It just gets these sensory inputs. And that's a philosophical question. I think it could. The engineering question is, is that a good approach just to listen to the radio and watch television? And I think the answer is definitely no. If you want to do perception, for example, as soon as you put one or two cameras on a robot and let the robot move around in the world, you get a very different view of what the questions are and how to solve them than if your idea of doing perception is just to take a database of images like ImageNet. Um, because you have the option of changing viewpoint and seeing how things move as you change viewpoint. Um, you have a task to do. Um, you, you have to be able to ignore things that aren't relevant. You really would like to have a fovea so you can see fine detail without swamping yourself all the time. It completely changes how you'd build your perceptual system. Um, so philosophically, you don't need to be embodied, but actually, as soon as you're embodied in a sensible way, it changes how you're going to do things. So for engineering, embodiment's important. However, there's a lot of hassle comes with embodiment, like right? you have to deal with the body. Um, so I think we can still make lots of progress on um, databases of just videos where um, I guess there was somebody making the video, but basically you're, you're just taking the video as data. There's lots of room for working like that without having a mobile robot where you don't control the data collection. But, but I've been a long time ago, Dana Ballard, um, back, probably back in the 80s, Dana Ballard realized that um, animate perception when you've got a robot moving around, it's just going to be have a very different flavor from standard computer vision. And I think he was completely right about that. The next one is from Ranjit Ravindran. Why do you do what you do? Do you believe it would make the world a better place? Or are you just having fun exploring the limits of human creativity? Much more the second one, I'm afraid. Um, so I really want to understand how the brain works. And I believe that to understand it, we need some new ideas. Like, for example, a learning algorithm for spiking neural nets. Do you think it's, um, this is a follow-up question of my own. Do you think it's almost necessary to be really driven by, by the kind of exploratory aspects? Or is it possible to be just as productive in research if, if you care more about the bottom line effect on the world? Is it just a different style? I think if you want to do fundamental research, you ha it has to be curiosity driven. You're going to do your best research when it's curiosity driven. You're going to be motivated to sort of ignore all the apparent barriers and pretend they're not there and see where you get. Um, whereas if it's for the bottom line, I just don't think you're going to be as creative. So I think the sort of the very best research gets done by graduate students in good groups. Um, with plenty of resources. So you, you need to be young and driven and really be interested in something. Next one is from Peter Chan, actually my, my co-founder and uh, CEO at, at Covariant, you know him. Um, he has a research organization question. Um, you've been a, I mean, you've been doing pure academic basic research at the university. You've done industry basic research at Google Brain. And you've also seen industry applied research while at Google, as well as at some, you know, some people you know who are involved in, in startups and so forth. Um, how do you think of these different places as providing maybe different opportunities to, to make research go forward, but also to, from there build products? To be honest, I don't think that much about building products. Um, Products are nice, they pay the bills, and um, companies would like to have products. Um, it's not what I really care about. What I really care about is um, how do you make big learning systems and how does the brain work? And 
The nice thing about the brain team at Google is they have the resources to explore big systems and lots of smart people to discuss things with. Um, and maybe I should care more about products, but I think it's, I believe in specialization. And so having everybody care about products is not necessarily the right mix. The next batch of questions is all centered around the brain. So I'm going to give you all the questions in, in one go, Jeff. So, and then you can see, you know, what perspective you want to give on this, this whole thing. The first one from Lucas Bayer is how does the brain work? Then Tim Detmers, what's your take on mixed learning algorithms? Backprop in cell body dendrites, but plus feedback alignment across neurons. Could such algorithms be both biologically plausible and competitive with pure backprop? Or is a single general algorithm more likely to exist? Prasad Kotari is wondering about spiking neural networks. Cedric Vandelaar, it seems you have drawn inspiration from the human brain in the past. Do you think there are certain techniques that will eventually turn out to be crucial? For example, spiking neural networks. Atan Kamanda, Jeff recently declared that he finally didn't think the brain was doing backpropagation, but it might be doing something akin to the Boltzmann machines. Does he see this kind of architecture come back as a viable AI model or as a theoretical model for how the brain works? And then the last one by Yigid is about the Engrad hypothesis. So it's a lot of related questions here. There's sort of one set of issues, which is if the brain is going to do something like backprop, how does it get gradient information to go backwards through the layers? And that's what the Engrad hypothesis is about. And it's the idea of using um, changes in neural activity to represent error derivatives. So using temporal derivatives for error derivatives. Um, I don't really believe in that anymore. Um, so let me go to the question about Boltzmann machines and do I believe in Boltzmann machines? Um, I, I wax and wane on Boltzmann machines because they're such a neat idea. Um, but right now, I believe in part of that, but not the main thing. So Boltzmann machines um, had these Markov chains, which required symmetric weights, um, which are implausible. Um, but there's another aspect of Boltzmann machines that I mentioned in the podcast, which is that they use contrastive learning. So a Boltzmann machine is more like a GAN than it is like typical unsupervised contrastive learning. In, in unsupervised contrastive learning, you take a pair of crops of the same image and say, make their representation similar, and a pair of crops from two different images and say, make their representations not too similar. Um, in a Boltzmann machine, you take positive data and say, have low energy for the positive data. Then you take negative data and you say, have high energy for the negative data. So, uh, but the data is just an image. It's not a pair of images or anything. It's just an image. No. Um, and I believe in that now. So I think that if we're going to get unsupervised contrastive learning working, what we need is to have two phases, like in a Boltzmann machine. We need to have a phase when you try to find structure in positive data, but not in pairs of crops only, but in the whole positive, the whole image. You're looking around for essentially agreements between locally extracted things and contextually predicted things. And then we need a different phase in which I show you negative images, things like real images, but that aren't real or slightly different. And what you're concerned with is that the structure you found in the real images shouldn't be in these negative images. So you want to find things that are in the positive data and not in the negative data. And that's how you protect yourself from finding structure inside your neural network that's caused by the wiring at the front end of the neural network. Anything caused by the wiring will cause the same structure for positive images and negative images. Um, and so you can filter it out that way. So there's an aspect of Boltzmann machines I really believe in, which is you have to use positive and negative data to protect yourself from just learning about your own wiring. But the idea of a Markov chain to generate the negative data I think it's just too cumbersome. I think we need other ways of generating negative data. And this is quite like GANs, right? So in GANs, you've got real data and you've got data generated by a generative model, and that's the negative data. And if you compare what I believe now with GANs, what I believe is that 
the discriminator, which is trying to decide, is this real or negative data, um, by finding structure that should only be there if it's real data. Um, that's the sort of main thing. And I want to use the internal representations of the discriminator as a generative model in order to get the negative examples for training the discriminator. So what I'm doing is a kind of, what I believe in now is a sort of cross between GANs and Boltzmann machines. But in GANs, it's not a Markov chain. The generative model is just a causal generative model, a directed generative model, which is much easier. And I think probably you have a discriminator and then a directed generative model that's learned at the same time for the negative examples. In principle, there's a unification, yeah, that's right? Because GANs can be rewritten as energy-based models, also just a, yeah. a specific yes. form of them. But the thing about GANs is you generate from random stuff at the top and it's hard to get coverage. There might be all sorts of things you never generate and you wouldn't know. Um, if your discriminator, you go to the top level of your discriminator and then you regenerate from the top level of the discriminator, you'll get coverage. So in a paper with the wake sleep algorithm that I published in 2006 with Simon Ossendera and Yi Wei Tei in neural computation, we have something but that doesn't use backprop. It manages to learn well without backprop. It uses contrastive wake sleep. And the contrastive aspect is that you do recognition. That's the sort of wake phase. And then you generate. But what you generate from is not random stuff but a perturbation of what you got when you did recognition. And that gives you coverage. So that's, I think there's a, maybe a unification coming along those lines. That seems a very concrete idea ripe for, for execution and could give some amazing it's results. It's yeah. actually running on my computer right now. It's running on my computer. Oh, you're running right it right now. now. <laughs> got it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other batch of questions related to, to the brain was of course on, on spiking. Um, the role of spiking? Well, I think it's very important. I think um, very early on in neural nets, um, Minsky and Papert, they hit on the XOR as a thing that a neuron couldn't do, right? They couldn't tell whether the two inputs were different. It's an exactly equivalent problem to, so to solve the same function. You can't tell whether the two inputs are the same. Obviously, if you could do one, it could do the other. Um, it's unfortunate that they went for XOR rather than same. Because if you go for same and say, well, our, our artificial neurons can't tell the two inputs are the same, you're immediately drawn to the idea that, well, if you use spike timing, you can tell whether two spikes arrived at the same time, because then they push a lot of charge into the neuron at the same time and will put it above threshold, um, particularly if the excitatory inputs followed by some inhibitory input. So they have to arrive in a narrow window. So spiking neural networks are very good at detecting agreement. And our normal neural networks need several layers to do that. And if we could just get a good learning algorithm, I think we would discover that they learn to make use of that ability. Just like they learn to make use of it really well for doing auditory localization. When I think about the transformer architectures, they're, they're also kind of designed to define agreements or correlations. Yes. Just a much more, I guess, <laughs> much bigger piece of machinery than, than maybe a spiking architecture. But it seems like there could be some connections there. I mean, there have been neuroscientists saying for years and years that it'd be crazy not to use the spike times. And there's people like Abilis who talk about SINFI chains. Um, it would be very satisfying to find a learning algorithm for these things and show that when you start learning, particularly on sequential data, like auditory data, um, then they really do make use of the spike times in a sensible way. And then you could use these spiking cameras. So spiking cameras are very clever things that give you lots of information, um, but nobody knows how to use it. Same with the auditory domain. People like Dick Lan have been saying for years we should be using spiking neural nets to represent auditory input, but nobody knows how to then take that representation and learn on it and do things with it. This is a follow-up question of my own, but if I think about spiking, and let's say I try to play devil's advocate here and try to maybe argue against a strong belief in, in spiking, I might, I might maybe say something along the lines of, 
Um, well, maybe the reason we have spiking in human brains is because maybe evolutionary, it was easier to somehow evolve or due to random luck of the draw, we evolved spikes, but I mean, or we didn't evolve wheels and, and wheels are maybe more effective at, you know, transportation, oh, even though we didn't oh, manage did. to evolve them. No, we did evolve oh, we did. Yeah, you have wheels. You, you just need to think straight. So you have to go over rough ground, right? And so you need a wheel with a six foot diameter. And that's going to be a lot of rim. Okay. So as soon as you know about time sharing, you decide, well, here's what I'm going to do. I have a wheel with a six foot diameter, but I'm actually only going to have two little bits of the rim. And I'm going to alternate between using these two bits of the rim. And I'm going to use it as a wheel. So I'm going to rotate about the hip, which is going to be a very low energy way of walking. And then I'm suddenly going to switch because I have to get it to go, go backwards. I have to fly back. Instead of going all the way around, I'm going to do a fly back. And then I'm going to use the other leg, the other bit of rim. And there's one other big difference, which is a normal wheel, the axle is suspended from the top of the wheel. And there's, there's pressure in the side of the wheel to hold it up. So the spokes are in tension. Um, you have to have something like the rubber tire for rough ground. And so what you have is you, instead of a spoke that's in tension, you have a spoke that's in compression. You just have one of them for each bit of rim, but it can bend in the middle. And that means you don't need tires because you can absorb a lot that way. And you don't have too much unsprung weight because you only got a bit of the rim then. But it's basically a wheel. It's just a time shared wheel. Now, there is one other little advantage the time shared wheel has, which is you don't have a problem in getting nutrients in because it doesn't go all the way around. It just goes forwards and backwards, so you can have blood vessels going into it more easily. But it, mechanically, that's just an energy supply problem. Mechanically, it really is a wheel. You're using it just like a wheel, a little bit of rim, and you're rolling like a wheel does. So you use very little energy, and then you quickly substitute one piece of rim for the other. And I'm surprised you didn't know we had wheels. <laughs> so maybe my bad <laughs> analogy aside, Jeff, do you think there's any possibility that just spiking was easier to evolve and that's why we ended up with... No, I think there's a very good reason Got for it. using it. But I don't know what it is. I think it's to do with coincidence detection. Next, the next thing you'll be saying is that when we make flying machines, we don't give them feathers. Well, I wasn't going to go there after you uh, so eloquently uh, <laughs> <laughs> told me I have that's a wheel. <laughs> That's what's wrong with drones, right? If you have a drone and the blade hits something, either it breaks a thing or it breaks a blade. If the blade was made of little bits of Velcro that zip together, when it hits something, it could break, and then the drone would land and it'd do a bit of preening and zip the Velcro back together again and it could fly off again. So really, um, we ought to make drones with feathers instead of rigid blades so that they could hit things without damaging them and without damaging themselves um, and have something that would preen the feathers to get them back together and off we go. So those are the two classic examples. People don't have wheels and airplanes don't have feathers. Well, they're both wrong. Uh, drones don't have feathers yet, but I think they will. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see when, when that happens. So the next couple of questions are, again, qu quite related, so I'm going to ask them in, in batch. Um, Abdullah Hamdi asked, What's the next paradigm shift in AI after deep learning? Ajay Divakaran, does the current deep learning paradigm suffice for transfer learning a la humans, or does it need to be fundamentally enhanced? And Arun Rao, what are the next milestones for deep learning going from existing foundation models to a long-term goal of AGI? And how does Hinton define AGI? I try and avoid defining AGI and I try and avoid working on AGI because I think AGI, there's all sorts of things wrong with the vision of AGI. It, it in, envisions an intelligent human like Android um, that's as smart as us. And I don't think intelligence is necessarily going to develop like that. Um, I think I'm hoping it develops more symbiotically. It, it's very individualistic. Um, and we developed in communities. We developed, so this goes back to your, what you said in the podcast about ants and so on. I think intelligence develops in societies better than it does individualistically. Um, and I think maybe 
we'll get smart computers, but they won't be autonomous in the same way. They may have to be if they're for killing other people, um, but hopefully that's not where we're going. Yeah, the earlier part was more kind of about the next transition. What's next after deep learning? I mean, that, okay. that's the question. I'm okay. not trying to imply there is something next, but that's the question. Right. So what I believe is this, that we won't, we're, we're going to stay with the very successful paradigm of tuning a lot of real valued parameters um, based on the gradient of some objective function. I think we'll stay with that, but we may, may well not be using backpropagation to get the gradient and the objective functions may be far more local and distributed. That's where I think we're headed. Next question is from Dystopia Robotics. Are you familiar with Rich Sutton's The Bitter Lesson? And oh, yes. what are your thoughts on it? I sort of have it in my lectures um, that the deep learning depends on two things. It depends on doing stochastic gradient descent in big networks that have a lot of data and a lot of compute power. And then on top of that, there's a few ideas that make it work a little bit better. Things like dropout and all, all the stuff we've worked on all make it work a little bit better. But the crucial thing is um, lots of compute power, lots of data and stochastic gradient descent. Um, and I agree with him. Next question is from Prabhav Kala. How do you read research papers? How to get past the mathematics and get a taste of the core message? Okay. Um, I don't read many research papers. I basically get my colleagues and my students to explain them to me. Um, I'm hopeless at mathematics. I can do it when I have to, to justify something I've already thought out. Like with Boltzmann machines, I figured out how they would work and then did the math to show that that's the right thing to do. Um, but I'm not very good at math and I always find it a big barrier reading papers to understand all the notation. Um, and I find it much easier if I get, um, so for neuroscience, I get Terry Sinofsky to explain it to me. And for computer science, I get my grad students to explain it to me. A very related question to what you just answered, Jeff, from Chaitanya Joshi. Many people have shared anecdotes on how Professor Hinton's mind works in a analogical and intuitive manner with an aversion to mathematics and proofs. Could Prof Hinton elaborate on the roles of formalism versus intuition when going about research? I think there's room for more than one kind of person. So I sort of hate formalism. I love intuition. I love tinkering about on my Mac to see what works and what doesn't. Um, I think it's very important to have foundational work um, and to really understand the mathematical foundations of things. Um, it's not what I do. It's good to have proofs. It's not what I do. Um, I think I have a little test I give people. Suppose there were two talks on at NIPS at the same time. One, and you had to decide which one to go to. One talk was about a really clever and elegant way, a new, totally new way of proving a known result. And the other talk was about a new learning algorithm that seems to do amazing things, but nobody understands why. Now, I know which talk I'd go to. Um, and I, I know that the it was easy to get the first paper accepted than the second one. But other people would really like to know new ways of proving things, because that's what they think is really interesting. I'm not like that at all. And I actually think nearly all the progress in neural nets has not come from um, doing the math right. It's come, come from intuitive ideas that are later on people do the math. That definitely resonates with me. Guillermo Martinez Villar asks, how did you transition from a background in psychology to the field of AI? And what would you suggest to young people considering doing the same? Okay, there's an interesting issue there. So when I was teaching at the U of T, um, if you looked at the undergraduates, there are a lot of computer science undergraduates who are very good. There were also cognitive science undergraduates who did minors in computer science, but were really cognitive scientists. And they typically weren't quite as good at the technical stuff, but they'd gone on to do much better things because they had the interest in the issues. They really wanted to understand how cognition worked. So I'm thinking of people like Blake Richards and Tim Lillicrup, 
who've gone on to do great things. Um, because they knew what questions they want answered, wanted answered, whereas most of the computer scientists didn't. Um, and for some reason, I thought that was relevant to the question. Could you say the question again? <laughs> it is very relevant to the question. Let me tee it up again. How did you transition from a background in psychology to the field of AI? And what would you suggest to young people considering doing the same? I don't know. Um, it's very hard to generalize from an M of one. I had a very weird career where I started off doing physics and physiology in my first year at university. In fact, I was the only student at Cambridge that year doing both physics and physiology. And then my math wasn't good enough for physics. And I wanted to know the meaning of life. So I did philosophy and developed strong antibodies. Um, and then I did psychology. Um, but I did have a, some quantitative background having done physics um, and physiology. So retrospectively, it was an interesting background. It it didn't happen with any design. It just kind of happened. Um, but I think, I think you need to have questions that you're driven by and not just techniques. It's more important to have questions that really excite you and you'd do anything to find the answer than to just be very good at some technique. However, I wish I'd learned more math when I was young. I wish I didn't find linear algebra complicated. Next question is from Khalid Saifullah. How conscious do you think, if at all, are today's neural networks? I guess Ilya would say just a little bit and get lots of flack for saying that. I have a view about consciousness. Um, so about a hundred years ago, if you ask people, what distinguishes living things from dead things? They'd say, well, living things have vital force and dead things don't. And if you said, what's vital force? They'd say, well, it's what living things have. Um, and then we developed biochemistry and we understood about um, how biochemical processes work. And since then, people haven't talked about vital force. It's not that we don't have vital force. We still have vital force, if we ever had it. Um, it's just not a useful concept anymore because we understand in detail how things work at the biochemical level. And we understand that, you know, the organs break down when they don't get enough oxygen and and then you're dead, and then it all decays. Um, and it's not like some vital force left the body and went to heaven. It's that um, the biochemistry just packed up on you. Um, so I think the same is going to be true of consciousness. I think consciousness is a pre-scientific concept. Um, and I think that's why people are very bad at defining it and everybody disagrees. And I don't have any use for it. Um, there's... There's many related concepts like, are you aware of what's going on in your surroundings? So if Muhammad Ali hits you on the chin, you're not aware of what's going on in your surroundings. And we use the word unconscious for that. That's one meaning of unconscious. But if I'm driving without thinking about what I'm doing, that's another meaning of unconscious. We have all these different meanings. And my view of consciousness is it's a, a kind of primitive attempt to understand what's to deal with what's going on in the mind by giving it a name and assuming there's some essence that explains everything. And here's a similar analogy for cars. If you don't understand much about cars, I can tell you how cars work. Cars have oomph, and some cars have more oomph than others. Like one of these testers with big batteries has a lot of oomph, and a little um, Mini doesn't have much oomph, especially if it's old. Um, and that's how cars work. And so some have more oomph than others. And obviously, if you want to understand cars, it's really important to understand oomph. Now, as soon as you get down to understanding oomph, you start understanding how engines work and torque and energy and how it's converted and all that stuff. And as soon as you start understanding that, you stop using the word oomph. And I think it's going to be like that for consciousness. Love this explanation, Jeff. Um, Farsane Mirzazade asks, ML once started with roots in human, human psychology. Do you see ML advancements today having the capacity to help better understand human psychology in the future, like seeing people as neural networks or classifiers and their cognitive distortions similar to under, overfitting, and so forth? 
Yes, I do. I strongly believe that. I strongly believe that when we eventually understand how the brain works, that's going to give us lots of psychological insight too. Just as understanding um, chemistry at the atomic level, understanding sort of how molecules bump into each other and what happens, gives us lots of insight into the gas laws. Um, the, the fine level understanding is important and does give rise to understanding what's going on at high levels. And I think it's going to be very hard to get satisfactory explanations of a lot of things going on at high levels. Things like schizophrenia, for example, without understanding the details of how it all works. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for, for making the time for the, uh, the additional Q and A, uh, section with, um, questions from our audience. Wow. What a way to wrap up season two. Thanks so much for all the great questions for Jeff and thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoy this show, please consider giving us a rating and please recommend us to your friends and colleagues.